of this term's primate conversations. Today, I get to introduce Philippa Hammond, who's a fellow PhD student in the Primate Models for Behavioral Evolution Lab here at Oxford. Um, during her academic career so far, her research topics have spanned a variety of human evolution-related fields, including mate choice, temporal and geographic trends in the East African fossil record, and most recently, primate adaptations to predation risk. She collected most of her data for her PhD in Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, where she spent about a year in total habituating and studying two troops of weapons. And with that, I will pass over to her so that she can tell us more about her research. Thank you, Jana. Thanks for the introduction. And um, it's great to be here uh, on the other side of Primate Conversations. Um, and yeah, as uh, Jana said, I have been working in Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, uh, which you may have heard a bit about last week if you were here for uh, Professor Robert Pringle's talk. Um, and uh, I've been studying the baboons there. Um, as a bit of a, of a preface, um, my, oh, is the, are the slides changing? It doesn't look like they've changed yet. Okay. There oh, we there we go. Now that's changed. Great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so as a bit of a preface, my interest uh, lies in behavioral evolution in primates. And um, we have a rich fossil record uh, that tells us a lot about the evolution of primates in Africa and all over the world. Um, uh, and many of you will be familiar with uh, many of these fossil sites down the East African rift system and in the cradle of mankind down here in South Africa as uh, sites where we have evidence of our own um, hominin ancestors. Um, and what we can learn from fossil sites is not only about the primate species that have come and go, gone over, over the years, but also we collect paleoecological data and climatic data that tells us a bit about the um, selection pressures that might have driven evolution, um, including behavioral evolution in these species. Other uh, selection pressures are harder to infer from the fossil record. And this includes um, the dynamics that exist between predators and prey and how this might drive changes in behavior. And indeed, um, uh, the kind of evolutionary arms races between predator and prey species are thought to be quite influential on uh, behavioral adaptations. Um, and in this field, there's often a discussion um, around the landscape of fear. And this has had many definitions and um, ways of measuring it um, in the past, um, but to kind of reduce ambiguity, I'll be using um, a de definition discussed by uh, Caitlin Gaynor um, in a recent publication that, that essentially defines the landscape of fear as the perceptual representation of spatial variation in risk. So when we're studying um, a prey species, let's say a baboon here who needs to navigate around the physical landscape, there are certain things we can measure. Uh, we can measure the actual risk that exists in that landscape, uh, how many and where certain predators live. Um, but there are other factors that influence perceived risk, um, and that includes mediating variables such as uh, the openness or the closeness of the environment, which uh, might affect perceived risk in nonlinear ways. Uh, for example, more, more trees might reduce visibility and heighten perceived risk of a predator. Or um, for a species like a primate, more trees might provide a refuge uh, and therefore reduce perceived risk. Um, and so we can also measure the the responses of prey uh, species uh, when they encounter risk. So for example, this baboon here is, is vigilant. Um, if it sees a lion, perhaps it's more vigilant. Um, but what's harder to measure directly is uh, the, the, what's going on inside the prey species head. So in this case, when we see that the baboon is more vigilant, we assume that they're perceived risk is heightened in a certain area. So in this case, it's kind of a direct response to there being a lion there. But um, there, are, there are other ways in which this might be playing out. So 
it might be that not all predator species invoke the same level of perceived risk. For example, uh, for baboons, they might perceive a higher risk of a predator like the leopard than the lion, just because um, leopards are thought to be baboons' uh, primary predator and lions prefer a slightly larger prey. Um, and there are other factors that might have nothing to do with where and how, what type of predators are actually in, in the environment. So, um, for example, uh, this kind of wooded area in an environment might be seen as a riskier area if it reduces visibility. Um, likewise, there are temporal dynamics at play. So regardless of where predators are, um, the, the landscape might be perceived as riskier at nighttime than during the daylight hours. And this is, um, again, perhaps because of reduced visibility, but also for uh, prey species like baboons, uh, many of their predators are more active at night uh, or in the early hours of dawn or, or dusk. So these are the many things that could be going on uh, inside a prey species mind as they encounter the landscape and try to navigate where is safe to move around and to, to weigh up uh, risk and reward when they, when they go out foraging. Um, and this brings me to uh, our study site, Gorongos National Park, um, where we have a potential example of a landscape of fearlessness. Um, so Gorongosa is um, home to over 200 troops of Chakma baboons. And um, as you may have heard a bit about last week in uh, uh, Professor Pringle's talk, um, there's some really interesting uh, history to the park in that it was at the heart of the um, Mozambican Civil War um, through the 70s to 90s. And of course, there was a lot of devastation during this time, and this included um, a real loss in the wildlife po populations in the park, which declined by over 90% during the time. Um, and uh, essentially, um, the one of the uh, major losses from the ecosystem was of apex predators. So before the war, Gorongosa uh, was home to lions, leopards, wild dog, uh, hyenas. And unfortunately, after the war, um, there was only a small surviving population of lions and the other, um, the other predators were essentially extirpated from, from the landscape. And uh, there's been, since the war, there's been a lot of conservation effort that has resulted in a recovery of many uh, animal species. Um, and this has been kind of asymmetric. So you can see from this graph that the meso herbivores now rather outweigh the mega herbivores that once dominated the landscape. And these graphs just give you an idea of how many of these species populations have, um, have grown since the war um, and since the park has been under a more kind of conservation management. And down here in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that baboon troops have really flourished um, with, without predators uh, around. And this results in the over 200 troops that we now see living within the park's boundaries. Um, and in addition to this population growth of, of many species, there's also been behavioral changes that have been recorded uh, in this uh, potential landscape of fearlessness. Um, so for example, uh, the Princeton team um, did this research on on bushbuck, which are a species that usually prefer protective closed habitats. But in Gorongosa, they've actually started venturing out into more open areas, um, which has had consequences for, uh, for, for the bushbuck themselves, but also actually downstream effects on the plant populations uh, in that area and on the floodplains. So there's really, the loss of predators from a habitat is really um, known to, to create some of these shifts and cascading impacts. And um, while this is an example of an antelope species, we were there to study the baboons and of course like different prey species um, will have uh, different behavioral strategies um, and uh, uh, habits that that uh, come out of living in a in a landscape without predators. 
So um, today I'll be presenting three uh, sets of data, well, three sets of analyses uh, that give you an insight into the Gorongosa baboons and how they respond to risk. So the first is from um, two focal baboon troops within the park, um, and the, these data were collected during habituation of these troops. Um, then we'll kind of scale up and have a look at some data collected from camera trap grids, uh, one established within the park's boundaries and one just outside in a, in a sustainable use forest reconcession. And then the third set of data scales up even further to kind of contextualize the Gorongosa baboon data um, in comparison to data um, collected from camera track grids all across Africa um, in, in an area that encompasses uh, Chukma baboon's home range, uh, yellow baboons, and up in the north, olive baboons too. So, the first set of data, as I mentioned, we collected this during habituation of two focal troops. This was done in 2018. Um, and it was, we, we chose uh, one troop uh, living in the floodplain, one in the woodland, so quite different habitats you can see from, from the photos here. And during our daily follows of these troops, we were collecting data at regular intervals on observer-directed vigilance, on vocalization rates within the troops, on habitat structure uh, that they were moving through, and on substrate use, so whether the baboons were spending time on the ground or up in trees. And the idea was to use observer-directed vigilance and vocalization rates as, um, as markers of perceived risk where us humans were kind of the risk stimulus and to monitor whether perception of us as a risk uh, declined with habituation. And you can see um, this graph shows the, the probability of observer-directed vigilance during these scans that we performed and how this declined uh, over the habituation period. So this was good news that the, the baboons we were, were following appeared to be perceiving us as, as lower risk as they got more used to us in their environment. But we also learned some things uh, from this data about how, um, how other factors affect perceived risk. So for example, you'll notice that perceived, uh, that vigilance was higher in the woodland troop than the floodplain troop consistently. And um, there could be several explanations for this, but what was interesting is that within each troop's home range, um, the same pattern emerges in terms of habitat structure. So even within the woodlands troops home range in areas where um, the where the habitat structure was more closed uh, the likelihood of vigilance was higher than than where it was more open um, and similarly this is uh, the graph showing vocalization rates which also declined over habituation um, and what you see is that vocalization rates were higher when um, when ground cover was, was high, so when the grass was high and potentially restricting visibility. And so this gives us an idea that perhaps, um, yeah, the, the habitat structure is influencing how much of a risk is perceived of the same stimulus um, uh, during this time. Interestingly, there was also um, an effect of time of day. So both measures, uh, vigilance and vocalization rates were significantly higher uh, towards the end of the day than earlier in the day suggesting perhaps that this was seen as a riskier time of day, perhaps as the, as the baboons were moving to their sleep sites, uh, we were seen as, as a greater risk. Uh, that's a possible interpretation. And uh, the other result that came out of this study was um, to do with terrestriality. So both um, when, when vigilance was high and when vocalization rates were high, baboons were less likely to be on the ground, suggesting perhaps that when um, perceived risk is higher, they uh, prefer to be in the trees than on the ground. Um, so this 
led me to question how is baboon terrestriality affected by risk at a landscape scale and when we think about risk from actual predators rather than using uh, researchers as a kind of proxy um, <clears throat> and to investigate this question uh, we used camera trap data um, and so this data is taken from two camera trap grids um, one established within Gorongosa Park uh, by Caitlin Gaynor, and that's been running since 2016. Um, and the other established in a sustainable use forestry concession just outside the park's boundaries. Um, that was established by uh, Tara Easter in 2017. And so they, they were running at slightly different times, but they did uh, overlap. The one within the park has been going for longer. And for those of you uh, less familiar with camera trapping, uh, although there have been some recent, um, some recent exciting innovations in terms of putting camera traps up in uh, the canopy of trees, most camera trap studies involve attaching a camera to, to trees um, at about a meter or so off the ground. And so they, they really only capture activity that's happening on the ground. Um, and uh, this is just a, a personal favorite image from our camera trap data. I'm not sure what happened in this baboon's uh, life that day, but they don't look too happy. Um, but as you can see from the image, this is the kind of output we get from the camera trap uh, grid. And each image is stamped with time and date. And we also know the location of the camera where it was captured. And this allows us to perform spatial and temporal analyses of activity patterns of all the species captured within the grid. So the two grids here um, both cover uh, covered an area of just over 300 square kilometers. Um, and there are some key differences between them. Uh, so in Gorongosa National Park, uh, the grid covers an area with a lot more variation in habitat type. So um, yeah, from more open environments to slightly more woodland environments, uh, whereas in the forestry concession, this area is a lot, it has a lot more uh, tree coverage. And another key difference between the two grids is that in Gorongosa, um, Although since this data were, these data were collected, there have been predators reintroduced to the park, including wild dogs and leopards. At the time of this data collection, uh, the only predators present in this gridded area were, um, were lions and a small population of lions. Um, and by contrast, uh, up in the forestry concession, the, um, the only apex predator uh, detected across this grid uh, were leopards. So we used this data to ask a few questions. Um, the first one being, does terrestrial activity of baboons vary with tree cover? It, are baboons just less active on the ground when there are more trees? Um, and the next question is about their interaction with predators. So are baboons less active on the ground in areas where lions are more active on this grid and where leopards are more active on this grid? So the, what are the effects of localized um, predator presence? And then uh, the third question is kind of a broader scale question about um, whether the predator species present across the grid uh, makes any, any difference to baboon activity. So that first question, um, we found that across each grid, there was no significant relationship between tree cover and terrestrial activity. Uh, but if you have a look at both grids, um, you will definitely notice that the overall activity in the forestry concession uh, was lower than uh, in Gorongosa National Park. And there are, there are several possible explanations for this. So as mentioned before, uh, the, the tree cover coverage in the forestry concession is just a lot higher in the in that area so perhaps baboons are spending more time on the uh, in the trees and just not getting captured uh, on the ground 
uh, on the camera trap grids. Another option is that there are actually just fewer baboons uh, living in this area compared to within the main park. And we don't have population numbers uh, for comparison there. And a third, uh, but not mutually exclusive option here is that because leopards range in this forest reconcession area, they might be either um, keeping the baboon population uh, lower than within the park, uh, or baboons in this area, if they perceive leopards as more of a threat than lions, they may be either avoiding this area or spending more time off the ground. So <clears throat> this brings us to the question of how does baboon activity vary by predator presence? And so we actually find no significant effect of localized predator presence. So across the Gorongosa grid, uh, there's no significant difference between baboon activity in areas where lions were detected and in areas where no lions were detected. Um, if anything, baboon activity is actually higher in areas where lions were detected, which is potentially just because in general, um, all animals across the grid prefer certain areas if it's closer to water, if there's uh, more food available. Um, so we might just be seeing that there. But it, as I said, it's, it's not a significant difference. And similarly, in the forest reconcession grid, uh, there was no significant difference between baboon activity on the ground uh, in areas where leopards were detected uh, versus not detected. So this kind of localized presence of predators uh, did not seem to affect which areas of the grid baboons were more active on the ground. But what we did find is that there is a somewhat different pattern in how in the times of day that baboons were on the ground across the two grids. So um, you see here that across the Gorongosa grid, um, baboons are pretty active at dawn and dusk and during daylight hours. Uh, whereas in the forest reconcession area, baboons really um, restrict, the, the detection of baboons on the ground is really restricted to daylight hours. Um, and there's minimal activity at dawn and dusk, which um, is defined here as the two hours around uh, sunrise and sunset, respectively. So this is, this is pretty interesting because um, there's also been some recent research uh, on using collar data, collar data on baboons and leopards uh, from olive baboons in Impala, Kenya. Um, and, and that data found that um, uh, baboons rarely, very rarely leave their sleep sites before sunrise. And also that on nights when leopards were, when leopards visited sleep sites um, along, uh, yeah, riverine sleep sites, um, baboons were, baboons left their sleep sites significantly later in the day than on nights when leopards had not been present at those trees. Um, so it seems like the presence of, of leopards and the perceived risk of leopards influences the time baboons are willing to descend from the trees, leave their sleep sites and uh, get out um, foraging and, and get on with their day. And we have seen this in that collar data that's been published. And it seems like maybe that's what's happening here in Gorongosa where uh, the baboons are released from um, kind of predation pressure, perhaps they're getting up earlier and getting active on the ground earlier. So this brings us to the kind of third scale of analysis, uh, which asks how does risk affect deal activity patterns? So baboons activity patterns over the 24 hour cycle. And um, this is where, uh, I've been really lucky to have access to camera trap data from several African sites. And as I mentioned, it covers a huge geographic area um, encompassing three baboon, uh, baboon subspecies home ranges. Um, and so I, so I went looking in published data uh, to see what 
I could learn about uh, baboon activity patterns um, and their predators' activity patterns. And so this is data from a study conducted in Udzungwa Mountains in Tanzania. And they were actually looking at leopard activity patterns and how um, and how these overlap with several of the leopard's prey species. So the curves that you're looking at here in black, you're looking at um, the leopard's activity patterns. So the probability of a leopard being detected across a camera track grid at certain times of day, you can see um, they're fairly active around dawn and dusk, and then a dip in the middle of the day. And in blue, you are seeing uh, the baboons activity patterns, which you can see is, is fairly, um, the, the probability of detecting baboons on the ground in this camera track grid is definitely uh, at its highest in, in the middle of the day. Um, and what was interesting from this study is that baboons were actually the prey species who had the least overlap in uh, activity with leopards. And this got me thinking that that is perhaps because uh, whilst a, an antelope species like a, like a bushbuck can only avoid leopards on the horizon, horizontal um, plane, uh, baboons do have this added advantage of being able to uh, kind of both avoid areas where leopards may be, but also perhaps um, spend more time in the trees when they, uh, when they feel that the risk is higher. Um, and so this is an, another set of data um, that's also been published. They were not specifically looking at baboon activity, but I've just visualized data from uh, the set um, from Lake Manyara. These are olive baboons. And again, you kind of see that their activity pattern is, um, is really centered uh, towards the middle of the day and there's not too much activity around sunrise and sunset. And you can look at this in relation to the lions detected in this area and the leopards and hyenas, all of which um, have fairly nocturnal or crepuscular activity patterns um, and appear to be, uh, and the baboons appear to be really um, active in the, at the opposite times of day. Um, and so uh, this is, so we then used data uh, that we, we wanted to get as much data as we could about baboons uh, across sites in Africa. And we uh, have been really lucky to work um, with Meredith Palmer and the many researchers and citizen scientists who have made um, Snapshot Safari um, uh, a success. So if you haven't heard about this, this is an initiative that um, has coordinated many researchers from sites across Africa and actually um, beyond uh, to, to collect camera trap data in a kind of standardized way, publish the data in a, uh, extract the data in a standardized way. And um, the, the images have all been processed by many, many citizen scientists um, and increasingly uh, uh, using machine learning. Um, and so there's just so much data available uh, from, from these sites um, on the various species uh, in inhabiting these ecosystems. Um, and so we decided to have a look at what uh, the baboons were doing across these sites. Um, so we've got five sites from the snapshot safari data, which is publicly available, and then the two the two Gorongosa sites that I have already described before. And the first step was just let's have a look at when baboons are active across all these sites. Um, so uh, this is this is the sites that we um, have data from, and as you'll see here. Uh, the Gorongosa baboons have a slightly unusual activity pattern in that you're actually most likely to detect baboons on the ground in this grid um, soon after sunrise. And uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty different to the other sites where most baboons' um, activity patterns are kind of centered towards the middle of the day. Um, and we can have a look at the different predators inhabiting these various ecosystems. So there are lions across uh, several of the sites. There are leopards across um, 
uh, most of the sites, um, only one leopard detection in this um, mountain zebra park. But interestingly, um, the only other site besides uh, Gorongosa that doesn't have leopard detections is down here in Karoo, where we see a, a bit more uh, nocturnal activity than uh, the other sites. And then there are also hyenas across several of the sites. Um, so this, this just gives you an idea of um, how the Gorongosa uh, baboon activity pattern appears to be somewhat shifted uh, towards earlier in the day compared um, compared to other sites. And another way of looking at this is uh, to test whether there are differences in when baboons first appear on the ground as detected by these camera trackwords. And across all these sites, um, the Gorongosa baboons, they appear significantly earlier on the grid. So, so the first detection of Gorongosa baboons on our camera track grids was um, the average is 38 minutes uh, after sunrise. Whereas at all other sites, um, baboons are only first detected on the grid a good hour or, or more um, after sunrise. And I should say that all the sunrise and sunset times have been uh, standardized across these across these different sites. Um, and similarly with sunset, uh, we see that it's not as pronounced a, a distinction, but the baboons in Gorongosa again are seemingly staying out a lot later. So the last detection of baboons on average uh, is 84 minutes before um, Sun, sunset in Gorongosa, whereas um, it's often a lot earlier across many of these other sites. And um, yeah, so taken together, this, this data all suggests that the baboons in Gorongosa are spending prolonged periods of time, perhaps, on the ground, or they're just using, using different uh, times of day uh, for terrestrial activity compared to baboons in um, these other sites that we have looked at. Um, and of course, I mean, this, this just opens a whole set of further questions and um, uh, future directions for this research. So I think it'll be really interesting to unpick the kind of nuances of whether it's specifically um, the lack of leopards in an environment that's, uh, that's um, that's kind of creating this landscape of fearlessness and that might be causing these uh, changes in terrestrial and deal activity patterns or whether it's more to do with the absolute numbers of predators within a landscape or if it's to do with the um, diversity and kind of completeness of the predator guild. So it will be interesting to add more sites um, to uh, to these data sets and also to monitor Gorongosa uh, over the longer term because um, as I mentioned previously uh, there have since since the data presented here were collected there have been reintroductions of wild dogs and leopards and there are hyena uh, reintroductions planned in the park um, so it'll be really interesting to see that whether uh, the reintroduction of these various predators and specifically leopards um, causes any noticeable shifts in the amount of time that these baboons are spending on the ground and if they start getting up a bit, uh, bit later in the day. Um, I think there's also questions to be asked about uh, what the role of population density is because um, it's unclear whether it's just that as soon as there are there's lower risk in the environment, maybe baboons don't feel the need to stay um, in their sleep sites as as late, or there might be um, there might be some other pressures on, for example, the Gorongosa baboons now that their population has got so large. Perhaps there is pressure from competing troops uh, to get out early um, and to get foraging before your neighboring troops. Um, and this is now possible uh, without the kind of risk of predation in those early mornings. Um, so yeah, I think there's still a lot uh, of questions to be asked and, and, um, and also 
of course, this kind of really broad scale analysis is it's amazing to have this kind of big data set and to be able to look across a continental scale um, at what activity baboon activity patterns are like but um, the, there's so much variation within that we have um, uh, several subspecies within within the uh, sites we were looking at and of course we know that baboon um, baboon have all sorts of different behaviors across these subspecies and also within each of these sites there's likely to be so much variation um, so I think it's very important to always be combining these kind of broader scale analyses with um, the in-depth uh, behavioral observations that you can only really get through immersive research at each site but um, yeah, it will be really un interesting to unpick this further. And um, yeah, thinking just kind of of how it all scales up, we notice that this behavior we saw during habituation where uh, baboons were spending less time on the ground when they seem to perceive us as a higher risk seems to scale up uh, to a landscape scale where baboons are perhaps spending more time on the ground when they're in a landscape of fearlessness, uh, when they do not have too much risk of predation. And so thinking of scaling that up even further, um, what are the implications for primate behavioral evolution uh, when, when this kind of perceived risk is reduced or disappears from a, from a primate's landscape? Um, it's yeah it's very interesting to kind of speculate about uh what the knock-on implications of this extra time spent on the ground might be um for example uh there could be advantages for travel uh extra time for traveling on the, on the ground uh for foraging for example getting out to to certain uh, spots with riper fruits early in, in the day and there could be thermoregulatory benefits if um, primate species like these baboons can do more of their activity earlier in the day uh, when it's a bit cooler without um, the risk of having to weigh up the risks of uh, predation. Um, and yeah, there could be even further uh, knock on effects um, in terms of kind of a, a shift or a change in behavioral repertoire. Uh, we know from, from a lot of research on primate species, but even amongst other taxa such as birds that uh, most tool use happens on the ground. So if a primate species has more time on the ground, what are the implications for their, for their use of tools or the, the, um, their kind of time that they might have uh, for innovating with those tools? And in the much longer term, um, what are the morphological adaptations and changes that you might see once once a baboon uh, one, once a primate species is spending significantly more time on the ground? Um, and as humans who spend a lot of our time on the ground, I think um, these are really all very interesting uh, considerations when we think about our own evolutionary history, um, and just it reminds us that um, when we interpret the these fossil records and and we uh, learn about the ecology of um, extinct species um, there are also these more dynamic uh, selection pressures that were at play such as uh, predator prey dynamics um, that were also influencing uh, behavioral evolution over over millions of years um, and with that um, I just really like to say a, a big thank you to everyone who has contributed to this research. Um, my supervisors have um, been incredible at every stage. Um, we've had a, a lot of help and collaboration with um, people outside of our group, uh, Caitlin Gaynor, Tara Easter, Meredith Palmer, uh, to name a few. Um, and as I mentioned, the Snapshot Safari um, and Zooniverse initiatives are really amazing and so a big thank you to all the researchers and citizen scientists who've been involved in that and to all the fish guys and um, staff at Gorongosa National Park who've made our work possible and um, and enjoyable um, and with that I think I'll 
take any questions if there are any. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. It's always really enjoyable getting to hear more about what a fellow PhD student is doing because we see the bits and pieces along the way and then we get to see it all put together. So that was really enjoyable. Um, so for questions, I'll start out with kind of two questions that fit well together um, that are both about kind of the vocalizations. So the first one was, how do you think troop size may play into your vocalization rates? Maybe more eyes watching the ground. I mean, more eyes watching means lower general co concern about risk or could troop size be skewing your comparison? And then the second one was just kind of wondering if there's anything you wanted to expand about um, regarding the differences in vigilance between the woodland troop and the floodplain troop. Um, yeah, so I think with the vocalization rates, of course, because um, we were we were essentially just counting the number of vocalizations within a set amount of time at a standardized interval. And so the 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 floodplain troop is a smaller troop. So overall, you would expect there to be less vocalizations. But even when we tried to kind of account for vocalizations per individual, um, the floodplain troop was just a lot quieter um, than the woodland troop. And I think, um, I mean, it's possible that, yeah, that in the floodplain, they, the baboons might have been, it might have been much easier to, to see the um, researchers, and therefore they maybe didn't need to vocalize if they were kind of just aware that they were there. Um, Another possibility is that I think probably needs more investigation and that I was discussing with Susanna yesterday is that there might be incentives to not vocalize, um, for example, for alerting um, other troops in the area to your presence. Um, so I think like the risk from other troops or the competition from other troops is, is something that we, we don't really um, go into in, in that research. So that's something to think about. Um, and in terms of vigilance between the two troops, um, again, it was just noticeably lower in the floodplain. Um, and it's possible that in the woodland where the troop was so huge, it was over 88 baboons, um, it's possible that there were just um, so many of them and in a more closed environment that perhaps uh, not all the baboons uh, habituated at the same rate to our presence. So some of the baboons maybe only saw us occasionally if they were right at the front of the troop and we were at the back. Um, so it's possible that we were just, the vigilance was coming from, from different individuals um, habituating at different rates. Um, so yeah, lot, lots of variation, I'm sure, even within each troop. Thanks. The next two questions actually kind of also are on a similar topic. So the first one is, um, and they're both related, which is why I'm asking them together. Um, so you've kind of already answered this, but do you think the lack of vocalizations in open areas may be a strategy to avoid being detected by sound? Um, it can be difficult to see anything in the distance in the floodplain on a hot day. Uh, and then the second one that is also kind of tied in was, did you at all look at the general difference in, um, in vocalizations and not just specifically kind of the, the, the vigilance um, related ones? And was there any kind of evidence that there was um, kind of a higher need for vocal communication in general when there's reduced visibility? Mm, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so I haven't looked at the, the data on this. We did collect data on other vocalizations, for example, grunting. Um, and I, have, I haven't looked at the data, but just when we discussed it, um, Lynn, Lewis, Bevan, and myself, who we were each kind of habituating the two troops. And when we would discuss it, um, it seemed like the woodland troop did a lot more grunting um, and, and would often do it before, before moving on from a certain like foraging patch. Um, so maybe, maybe the vocalizations are a, a a factor of living in a more closed environment, perhaps it's a good way to coordinate the group or just to alert one another to, for example, moving on or to the presence of, of a risk or an unexpected, um, unexpected agent. Um, so it's possible that the, the woodland troop just need to be more vocal than the floodplain troop because the floodplain troop can see what's going on uh, at all times more easily uh, within, as in within their own uh, 
within their own troops. So yeah, it might just be that vocalizations are needed more in closed areas. Uh, the next question is regarding the kind of human evolution implications. Um, so regarding human evolution, what do you think the marked difference of results in two troops in the same region um, kind of could be? Could this help explain some of the locom locomotory variation seen in the late Miocene record? Um, so the, the differences between the troops or between the two camera trap grids? Um, I'm I think this is regarding the two troops being in such close proximity to each other in terms of kind of in the same national park and in the same region. Okay. Well, so the two troops that we were habituating, um, the difference in their locomotive behaviors uh, was, was um, I mean, the floodplain troops spent a lot more time on the ground, um, but possibly just as a... Um, the fact of that they didn't have any trees when they were out on the floodplain. So I think they were spending a lot of time on the ground compared to the woodland troop. But even the woodland troop who were surrounded by trees were spending the majority of their day on the ground. Um, but if we're thinking about even the geographic proximity of the two camera trap grids, so the one just inside Gorongosa National Park, and then the one um, in the forestry concession, um, those are, those are geographically pretty close. And what we're seeing is some very different patterns and activity on the ground, um, which, I mean, we can't say for sure. It's just because of the leopard presence. It could also be a combination with the availability of trees and so on. But I think when we're interpreting the fossil record, we're often trying to make um, generalizations from fossil sites um, that you know we have we have to kind of uh think about things in terms of millions of years and over quite large geographic regions so i think it's very interesting to see that two neighboring populations of baboons can have really quite different behaviors um which potentially is just because of the slight difference in um predator guild composition. Um, and so those kind of dynamics are really um, perhaps lost in the fossil record, um, but are really interesting to think about how just one small pocket of change um, could, could drive evolution of a different locomotor adaptation. Um, and, and therefore, yet yeah, could be uh, these kind of dynamic factors at play could be behind the variation that we see in the Miocene um, primate locomotive behaviors. So the next question kind of leads on from this, which is um, with your experience as a field primatologist, also managing large data sets and getting familiar with the fossil record, what are the challenges that you found um, in addressing the paleoanthropological questions? Um, I think it is really, it's this mismatch um, in the kind of scales that you're dealing with. Um, because when you're trying to interpret the fossil record, like I said, you're, you're thinking of where you, you're bringing together data that um, represents a million years or more um, and trying to, to draw conclusions about the, the species that were living there during the time and the ecological data that has also been averaged across that kind of time period. And then when you're doing primate behavioral research, um, uh, you're, you're often only studying a troop, <laughs> one troop, or maybe a couple of troops. And I think it's, it's rare that we even have these kind of data sets with the, with the camera trap grids uh, where we can try and look at these broader scales. Um, so I think that using these data from, from several sites across Africa is an attempt to kind of bridge that gap of, of um, interpretation at different scales. Um, but it's still, it's still very hard to do. We obviously live in, in very different ecosystems now, and we're still only getting snapshots of these baboons' behaviors from uh, months or years of data. And that's very different to trying to interpret how uh, a particular morphological trait um, evolved uh, over millions of years. So moving on to kind of more questions about um, the baboons specifically, 
Um, so how good or bad is the night vision of baboons? Um, there's almost no activity of baboons at night, but is there maybe any camera trap evidence of more in um, more on full moon nights where there's better visibility? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, the I think um, it's generally uh, accepted that that primate vision, well, baboon vision is is not great um, at night. Uh, they definitely have uh, are adapted to daytime activities, and um, so so the question of moonlight and how that might affect whether they're active or not is a good one. Um, and there has been recent um, studies of chimpanzees that suggest they do utilize um, the the moonlight to to do a bit more um, activity at night. I have actually tried to look into this. I'm not finding any obvious difference in nocturnal activity on the closer to full moon uh, versus darker night. But I think it's just in general, the, the activity of baboons, even in, in Gorongosa, um, where we do see this really early morning activity and late evening activity, the, the number of, of detections of baboons on the camera truck grid in the middle of the night is still very low. Um, so it seems like this uh, this behavior of kind of finding a sleep site and staying in it overnight until there's a hint of light is um, a fairly conserved trait. And um, it might be interesting to see in areas maybe where there's more pressure in terms of like uh, hotter temperatures, um, maybe there would be more uh, of a pressure on the baboons, or yeah, to 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 use uh, nighttime for foraging, but um, we're not seeing that currently uh, in the data that I've looked at. Cool, thank you. Um, so the next one is um, again more kind of about baboon behavior and specifically in Gorongosa. Um, have there been any changes in baboon behavior inside the park since the introduction of other predators like wild dogs? Um, if you don't know, or if it's not known yet, um, would you expect to see any changes? Um, yeah, so we, I think we don't really know yet, um, especially at the, at the scale of the camera trap grid. Um, we, because the camera traps are deployed uh, for several months at a time, and then images have to be processed and um, annotated, we need to get all the data from the camera traps. It, it, there's kind of a year or so lag. Um, so. The wild dogs were first introduced in 2018 and then the leopards since then. So we're only just starting to see the data um, coming out uh, of the camera truck grids um, since these reintroductions. Um, so I can't really say too much on that front yet. Um, I'm not sure what we would expect to see with the wild dog reintroduction because wild dogs are not really known to predate on baboons. Um, there's only one reported case of that happening in Mana pools in Zimbabwe. And so, especially because these wild dogs are being released into a landscape with few competitors for them um, and lots of prey, I think they wouldn't necessarily choose baboons as their first choice. And from um, some information we've received from people studying the diets of various animals in the park, there's no, uh, there at least I, I think the last I heard about a year ago, there was no indication that um, baboon DNA was showing up in the wild dog's uh, feces. So it seems like they weren't necessarily um, hunting the baboons. But whether the baboons would have realized that immediately or not, um, I'm not sure how their initial response to that new risk would be. I think the reintroduction of leopards is where it will get very interesting. And I think, um, I would expect to see some sort of change uh, um, if we had data, for example, like the collar data that I mentioned from Impala in Kenya, where they, they noticed that baboons leave their sleep sites later on the days um, when baboons had been at that sleep, when leopards had been at that sleep site. So I think we would, if we had, if we could collect data at that kind of scale, I think we would see shifts I would predict we would see shifts fairly quickly um, but how long that will take to show up as, as a change in overall activity patterns across the grids especially when there's only a few leopards um, that's harder to predict but definitely um, will be interesting to find out. 
So kind of continuing on with the Gorongosa theme, um, two more Gorongosa specific questions, uh, and then we'll move on to another topic. Uh, did baboon population numbers recover quickly after the civil war or did they not decline very much um, to begin with? And then the second question is just regarding um, seasonality in Gorongosa and um, how much of the area is flooded every year and how you think this might influence the patterns that you're seeing. I, I don't think we have great data on the baboon populations before the war. Um, so the graph that I showed with the increase in population size of the baboons, that is all collected since the war. Um, all we know is that the baboon population was relatively relatively small near th at the end of the war, and it has, it has grown massively since then. So we don't really know um, before that. But um, perhaps they have been part of the kind of boom of the meso herbivores. Uh, uh, like we saw, um, we've kind of lost a lot of the bigger herbivores from the Gorongosa ecosystem. So maybe as well as the loss of apex predators, um, that kind of shift in um, and the loss of mega herbivores might have also affected uh, how well baboons have thrived in the environment. Um, and oh, seasonality, yeah, so Gorongos is a pretty seasonal place. Um, in the wet season, there is, um, the floodplain can be completely flooded. And in the dry season, um, the water can pretty much disappear from um, at least the home range of, of at least one of the troops that we've studied in depth. Um, and so that will have, um, yeah, that, that affects baboon activity quite significantly. And actually uh, from the camera trap data, we know that the baboons are more active on the ground in the dry season than the wet season, um, which I guess um, could be explained by the fact that they are perhaps relying more on terrestrial foods like grass rather than um, fruits from the trees. And also perhaps because they're having to walk further uh, for water and for food um, and so they, they get detected by the cameras uh, more in the dry season than the wet. So on a broader scale now, um, based on kind of the evidence that you presented that predator presence impacts the dial activity patterns, do you know whether it may also impact how baboons allocate resources over their lifetime? For example, might their life history shift in terms of age at first reproduction, interbirth interval, et cetera? Hmm. <laughs> um, yes, I well, I think I have I have no um, data to kind of um, think about that. Uh, but I think I think the um, the kind the, I think as soon as there is a kind of release in um, well, that's a tricky one because if there's a release in in predation pressure. Um, baboons might just have more offspring rather than there being a shift in um, their like age at first offspring. Um, I think I'm not the right person to answer this kind of question, but there's a lot of people doing research on this, on this kind of thing and the longer term effects on life history. It would be interesting to know what life on the ground um, does for those kind of traits. Um, but I don't have a good answer for that yet. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to our, our, our last two questions here. Um, so the next one is, uh, could the presence and population size of other prey species also influence baboon behavior? I.e., could that provide some sort of collective safety in numbers, especially in the presence of easier prey? So could the presence of other species... Um, other like, potential prey species. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's another very interesting area of research is, is how different species um, learn from each other or use each other as cues for predators in the environment. Um, I mean, I think there, there's definitely been published um, records of, of this kind of interspecific I don't know, cooperation or, or exploitation, I don't know. Um, and, and just from a kind of anecdotal um, stance, we, we, um, we did notice when we, were, when we were habituating the baboons, like in the woodland, for example, the baboons would often be in an area foraging with um, 
Impala or Bushbuck, both of which uh, make a, a kind of alert call when they uh, sense some sort of risk. Um, and, and I did notice the baboons kind of uh, looking up uh, and being more vigilant when they when they heard uh, an alarm call from from like Bushbuck or Impala. Um, I mean, this is that that's just what it felt like they were certainly using each other as a kind of maybe protection in numbers or as extra eyes on the ground but um yeah so i think like in a place like gorongosa where there is so much other wildlife um in terms of prey species i think uh it provides extra numbers and and a kind of dilution effect um like for example the the wild dogs that have been reintroduced they seem to have a very strong preference for bush buck when they were first reintroduced so uh maybe if you're any other species you're pretty happy uh because the, they're focused on the bush bug great um so the last question is uh, specifically about the plots that you showed of the baboon and the lion and leopard kind of mm -hmm. um, presence in the different times of day in the different sites. So it's um, in some of the other field sites, specifically Serengeti and Karu, lion activity doesn't seem to be that closely related compared to the other sites with baboon activity. Uh, any thoughts on why this may be? And this is specifically regarding um, high nighttime activity, well, relatively, in both baboons and lions. Um, in I think Karu, and then high lion and baboon activity during the day in Serengeti. Yeah, um, yeah, that especially the Serengeti um, plot. It has a, um, I don't, I don't know if I should. Yeah, I, it has a surprisingly diurnal uh, lion population by the looks of it. Um, so. I do not know enough about the the intricacies of each of these ecosystems to kind of know why the lion activity is so different, for example, in Serengeti it, than in others. Um, and I think that's something that I am kind of just starting to unpick a bit now, um, because I think there's also other things to consider, like when we look at the um, when we look at the the predators in each ecosystem and in some in some sites if it's a national park for example where there is water provisioning which does happen in some sites then there may be um a kind of more homogeneous supply of water which would mean that the in the drier seasons like the prey um the prey animals and the carnivores have more options for getting water whereas in areas where there's perhaps a lot of seasonality and no water provisioning um, there might be more concentrated areas of risk um, around water holes in the dry season for example so i think there's still spatial and temporal um, factors within each of these sites that need further exploration and comparison um, uh, and and also, I mean, the baboon populations in in all of these sites, other than Gorongosa, are, are seemingly a lot smaller, or they're just less active on the ground. Um, so I think there's still a lot of uh, unpicking to do within each of these sites to see um, what's going on with the predator behavior and how that might be influencing the baboon behavior. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so finally, there are just a couple of uh, comments just saying that it was a great talk and that um, you had very well presented data sets and that they found your research uh, very exciting and interesting. So I wanted to pass those on. Thank you. Um, for everyone else, don't forget to join us next week uh, for Primate Conversations again at 3 p.m. on February 1st um, with Dr. Inzakone. And he'll be talking about community empowerment for the conservation of critically endangered primates in southeastern Cote d'Ivoire the role of transdisciplinary research. And we hope to see you then.